welcome you to this Bible study of the Banking Blessings Ministry. My name is Good Luck of Fable, and this is my wife. And today we have uh, guests, our family members visiting with us and uh, uh, participating in our program. Please introduce yourself. And my name is Aria Highness Walter Epo, and I'm visiting San Antonio today to uh, see my in-law and my, my sister. Good luck, okay. yeah. My name is Ugeze Ifiebo from Dallas, Texas, visiting San Antonio. Carol Okori, visiting from Dallas, Texas. Well, we are happy to have all of you and uh, we are going to have um, a good study tonight and uh, uh, towards the end we will have opportunity to make comments or ask questions for some discussion. That's uh, one of the benefits of having more people than just me and my wife. Um, we welcome you today to, this, to con our co continuing our study on living with adversity coping with adversity we as as human beings we will face situations in which things are not going so well with us at times the adversity is just as simple as that at times it is quite severe uh, we studied the account of job from the bible which is uh, an example of somebody that went through severe adversity and uh, we've looked at several a number of other cases but today we, we shift our attention to Mordecai uh, we are going to do a two-part study because Mordecai experienced adversity and triumphed over the adversity so we are going to look at what kind of adversity he, he experienced how did he live through it and in the second part of this Study, which will be uh, about two weeks from today, we will look at how he triumphed. What what happened to help him triumph over the adversity? As I said, this is going to be a two-part study on how Mordecai lived through and triumphed over adversity. In today's study, we are going to focus on Mordecai's living in adversity, how he lived through adversity, what did he do during his period as he was living in his adversity. Well, first we look at who was Mordecai, we we'll try to understand who, uh, how did we get to him, how we have a, a, a short account in the Bible, it's from the book of Esther gives a very short account of his life but there is enough there for us to understand the kind of adversity he lived through and the things he did that indicated that, that suggests to us what we should do in when faced with adversity, when faced with conditions that are not um, uh, that, that we consider adverse that is conditions that are, that are not palatable uh, then we will understand what his adversity was and how did he live? What did he do that helped him? In part two of the study, which is not tonight, we will be looking at how Mordecai triumphed over adversity. The entire series will be based on the book of Esther, chapters 1 through 9. Obviously, we're not going to read the whole thing. We will make selections from Esther that help us understand the, the points of the study. First, introducing Mordecai. Uh, Mordecai was among uh, the Jews that were carried into exile in, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar defeated uh, the king of Judah, Jehoiakim. Um, one of the things he did was he took captive, the king was taken captive, he took people, we went in the past, we looked at the account of Daniel and his friends Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, they were taken at the same time, and this man Mordecai, along with several other people, were taken at the same time. They were captured and carried over to Babylon 
from their home in Jerusalem and surrounding regions. Mordecai lived as a captive for a long time and uh, we'll find out that he actually was not a person of um, comfortable means. He, he, was, he, was, he was living in poverty as well. So there were several reasons why his life in captivity would not have been palatable, would have felt like an adversity. And as we look at it, in fact, it was an adversity. We'll look in more detail what his adversity was specifically. Uh, like we see here, we are, he appears to have worked uh, some of the time, not all the time, worked as, either as a watchman or attendant at the king's gate. So this was not a, a rich person, was a person of uh, a very modest means, if, if he had anything at all. But our understanding of Mordecai comes from Daniel chapter 1, just two verses, verses 1 and 2. Uh, to show that he was in fact carried off at the same time that Daniel and his friends were carried off from Jerusalem to Babylon. And then we'll go to Esther, chapter 1, verses 1 to 2, and chapter 2, verses 5 to 6, to learn a little bit about Mordecai before we go into the main story of the night. So, Obi will start with the reading. The book of Daniel, chapter 1, reading from the New International Version, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Verse 2. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put in the treasure house of his God. Okay. Ify. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm hearing from this time. This is what happened during the time of Xerxes. The Xerxes who ruled over 127 provinces. Uh, provinces. Provinces. Provinces stretching from India to Kosh. At that time, King Zetsai ran from his royal throne in the site of Susa. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin named Mordecai, son of Jer the son of Shine, the son of Kish, who had been carried into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Johannikin, king of Judah. Okay, so Mordecai was carried along with all the people that were carried from Jerusalem. The, he arrived uh, in Babylon and uh, they were held in captivity. Some of them were people of high, uh, we consider highly placed like Daniel and his friends. But Mordecai was one of the lowly, uh, that is people that we are, let's call them ordinary people. So he was in captivity, but he also was, the Bible doesn't call him poor, but we find that he walked, that appears temporarily at the king's gate as an, a watchman or an attendant. So, and, and this is at this time, at the time of King Xerxes, that there have been several other uh, kings before that. Nebuchadnezzar that got them, then Nebuchadnezzar's son, and then I think there was a third king, Darius, before. Uh, we got to this king that reigned, this, this was a Persian king that reigned over a very large area stretching from, um, uh, from Egypt, that is the region of Kush, it's actually northern part of Egypt, all the way to 
uh, what they call Persia at that time, which is, includes part of modern day Iran. So this was quite a large kingdom. And Mordecai lived through many of these kings. So we we'll said that he was he lived under this condition for several uh, decades, maybe three or four decades. I think they were in captivity for a total of seventy years. So let's say he was, you know, three, four, five decades of his life he lived in this condition. So that he so we consider him somebody that lived in adverse conditions. That he, 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 he because of his the, the, the because he, he, he probably most likely was poor but that's not the only thing towards the end uh, to, as part of the period of uh, this study he was put through a conspiracy a threat of the, uh, the conspiracy that was in fact a threat to annihilate all the Jews in, in, the, in that region all the Jews under this kingdom. Essentially the Jews that were carried off to exile. And uh, it was because of something that started with him. So this also made him, uh, uh, created a very bad feeling in him. So his adversity was because of one living in captivity to being a very poor person and then experiencing this conspiracy we will not talk about the conspiracy today because it's part of the second part of the study. But it, it's good to know that this is what added to his adversity, what made his conditions more, uh, more difficult to, to live with. Well, how did he cope with adversity? We will find, and this is most of the study for tonight, we will find that he coped with his adversity by remaining steadfast in his pledge to worship and serve God. He lived through, he lived this pledge. And he did three things that give us an indication that he was a godly person. He really worshipped God and he really served people based on his understanding of how God, what God uh, created us to do. One example is that he raised his uncle's daughter right from childhood. Uh, the, the girl's parents died. His, uh, his uncle, and that is Mordecai's uncle and, his, and, and the, the man's wife, they died at a very, leaving the, the daughter at a very early age. And um, he rose to the occasion. He took this girl and raised her as his own daughter. The girl turns out to be the person we know as Esther, and we're going to read a lot about her in this Bible study. Then, in his job as a, an attendant at the king's gate, he came across a plot to assassinate the king. And remember, he, he could have easily identified the king as the main oppressor, as the one of the people that brought his adversity to him. So in, in that, the, the temptation to look the other way, to say, hey, you know, let him get what is coming to him, was there. But he resisted this temptation, and in fact, we'll look at this in more detail, that he went straight and reported it. So that's one of the things that showed that he was a godly person. He didn't what, the way he related to people was based on his commitment to worship God and to serve God by serving, by doing things that God has created him to do, by being a provider assistant, we will discuss that later. The third thing he did is that when he was presented with a command to, um, to perform acts that were um, that amounted worshiping uh, an agent of the king, worshiping a, another human being, he refused. And there was, of course, threat of execution, and he knew about the threat of execution, but still refused. And we believe that the reason he refused to kneel and uh, and um, honor this man 
was because he interpreted it as an act of worship and he was committed to worship God and not worship human beings. Okay, so these are the three things he did and we are going to look at this in, uh, in, in, through the Bible, look at the details through the Bible. The first thing, remember I said, the first thing he did is that he raised his uncle's daughter as his own. That his uncle's daughter was Esther. Uh, the, Esther's parents died. Mordecai raised Esther as his daughter and advised Esther to enter into the uh, contest to replace the deposed queen. We'll read the, about the details starting Esther. Uh, chapters 1 and 2. Yeah, we will not read the whole thing, so we will read selection from Esther chapters 1 and 2. Um, but the first one was he, he, Mordecai helped Esther or advised Esther to enter the contest to replace the deposed queen. Well, we need to look at a little bit, a little detail about you know, what led this queen to being deposed. Uh, Vashti, Queen Vashti was the queen of uh, the king Zazis. Um, uh, Zazis had this ceremony in which he displayed the wealth of his kingdom for a period of six months, for 180 days, the Bible says. Then at the end of the period, he threw a party. He, he, he declared a banquet. Uh, a banquet, a seven-day banquet, which he entertained his people, and somewhere during this banquet, he um, he became drunk. He said he, he he was in good spirit because of wine. I don't know. That's a, a Bible's will say he got drunk. So he got drunk and sent a message to bring his queen. His queen, Queen Vashti, was also holding her own party, a separate party for women. And uh, so the king sent a message to Vashti to come in her royal dress and thus come and display herself among his guests. Uh, the queen refused. And uh, the king was furious, consulted with his people, and um, they decided to terminate her as queen. Of course, she was still his wife, but she was no longer the queen and that's how they ended up declaring a contest but before we look at the contest let us read a few selections from Esther chapter 1 to sort of get a sense of how Vashti was deposed as queen of uh, as queen under King Xerxes. Uh, we read from Esther chapter 1 verses 4 to 5 9 to 12, 13, 15, and 19. This time we start. Who read? Okay, we'll start from up here again. Let's start chapter 1, um, verse 4. For a full 180 days, he displayed the vast wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and glory of his majesty. When these days were over, the king gave a banquet, fasting seven days. Lasting. Oh, lasting seven days in the enclosed garden of the king's palace for all the people from the least to the greatest who were in the citadel of Susa. Okay. Ify. Wait, nine. Yeah. When Vasti also gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace, Zassi. On the seventh day, when King Zassi was in high spirit from wine, he commanded the seven Enlocks who served him to bring before him Queen Vasti, wearing her royal gown, in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely. Look at mm. Okay, I agree. 12. But when the attendants delivered the king's command 
when Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Oh, wait. Mm. Esther chapter 1. Verse 13. Verse 13. Still reading from New International Version. Uh, since it was customary for the king to consult experts in matters of law and justice, he spoke with the wise men who understood the times. 15. According to law, what must be done to Queen Vashti? He asked. She has not obeyed the command of King Zazis that the eunuchs have taken to her. If he. 19. Therefore, if it pleases the king, let, let him issue a royal decree and let it be written in the laws of Asia and Media, which cannot be repealed, that Vasti is never again to enter, enter the presence of King Zazi. Also, let the king give a royal position to someone else who is better than she. Okay, so we we'll see here Queen Vashti was deposed because she refused the king's order to come and display herself and then the people that the king consulted with felt that her order was a threat to the authority of husbands all over their kingdom and that if they didn't punish the threat then uh, if they let it go, then other women would do the same. But seeing this in, the, in terms, uh, with, from the point of view of Esther and Mordecai, and from the story, we are, we are, I mean, from the, um, from the subject of our study, what happened here really was that an opportunity, the, this whole debacle with Vashti was an opportunity being created for Esther. Of course, Esther didn't know it. Um, in fact, nobody knew that this was an opportunity for her. But it is later on that we we'll find out it is an opportunity. But in fact, I said opportunity for, uh, for Esther. We will see ultimately that in fact this was an opportunity for Mordecai. Remember, Mordecai was living in this uh, let me now describe it as abject poverty that is even in conditions that made him very unhappy but even though he was unhappy he was he, he was still doing things that showed him as a godly person and some of the things he did like one of them is taking care of Esther but by taking care of Esther, he was in fact laying the foundation for his, um, for his victory over his adversity, for coming out of adversity. So that foundation he was laying is the opportunity that started growing from, the, from uh, Vashti being deposed. Now, the opportunity uh, came actually when the king announced that um, well, the king consulted with his people and they said, okay, let us do a search among all the women over this entire region that the king was ruling. They appointed special commissioners to seek out young women, virgins, and send them to the palace. Not really the palace, but a, a, a region next to the palace that they called, uh, we'll see the name later on. And the intention was to place these women under the care of a eunuch who will give them beauty treatment, feed them special food, and then they will essentially compete for the king's attention. And whoever won the admiration of the king more than the others will become the queen. So it's, a, it's a, you know, a nationwide contest to replace Queen Vashti. So Mordecai advised Esther to enter this contest. Uh, the Bible really did, doesn't say he advised Esther to enter, but he advised Esther, for instance, not to reveal who she was 
not to reveal that she was a Jew and not, not to reveal her family. So that much is in the Bible. That tells us that he did discuss this with Esther before Esther entered. And I interpret that to mean that, uh, yes, he advised Esther to enter the contest. Esther not only entered, but one, we're going to see the details, she was chosen from among all these women to become the next queen of uh, King Xerxes. And based on Mordecai's advice, she did not reveal that she was a Jew. This will become important later on. But they didn't know, they just knew her as the lady that won. But they didn't really know because it was a very vast region that the king was ruling. So he didn't, the different languages, different nationalities, so he really didn't know who was who. So it, it was not, they didn't know that Esther was a Jew. I don't know if that would have made a difference, but they didn't know. Let us read about this. Esther chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, 7 to 11, and 15 to 17. Okay, we start. You read the last one? Yeah, if he did. If he did, yeah. So we start with Ike, read it. Esther chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, 7 to 11, and 15. Let the king appoint commissioners in every province of his realm to bring all these beautiful young women into the harem of her at the citadel of Susa. Let them be placed under the care of Hagar, the king's eunuch, who is in charge of the women, and let duty treatments be given to them. Okay, I'll be. Verse 4. Then let the young woman who pleases the king be queen instead of Ashti. This advice appealed to the king and he followed it. If it. Seven. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadatza, a woman who had broke up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman was who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. Uh, I get it. When the king's order and edict had been proclaimed, many young women were brought to the citadel of Susa and put under the care of Hagar. Esther also was taken to the king's palace and entrusted to Hagar, who had, who had charge of them, of the harem. She pleased, verse 9, mm -hmm. she pleased him and won his favor. Immediately he provided her with her beauty treatments and special food. He assigned to her seven female attendants selected from the king's palace and moved her and her attendants into the best place in the harem. Then, Esther had not revealed her nationality and family background because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. Every day he walked back and forth near the uh, county yard of the of the harem to find out how Esther was and what was happening to her. When, when, the, when the town came to Esther, the young woman Mordecai had adopted, the daughter of his uncle, <coughs> Abigail, to go to the king, she asked for no, nothing other than what Hagar, the king's honor, you know, who was in charge of the error, suggested and they start won the favor of everyone who saw her. Okay. And she was taken to King Sussex in the royal residence in the tenth month, the month of Tibet, the seventh year of his reign. 
Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women. And she she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So Esther replaced Vashti as queen. And this happened because she won the contest. First, she won uh, the admiration of uh, Hegel, so the, the man that the eunuch that was in charge of them. So the eunuch gave her attendance, gave her a special place, started her beauty treatment immediately, and she was. So when it was her turn to meet the king, which happened after about 12 months, she went to the king and uh, the king was very happy with her. Everybody that saw her admired her and they made her queen. So the little girl that Mordecai, the, the girl that Mordecai uh, raised, the orphan daughter of his uncle, that he raised as his uncle, now became queen of the land. Uh, it still wasn't clear how Mordecai was going to benefit from this, but we'll see later on that this become, became critical in his emergence from adversity. Another action of Mordecai that was critical to his emerging from adversity, but also showed the kind of person he was, even in his adversity, was that he uh, got no, became aware of this plot to assassinate the king. And uh, he, he didn't keep the information to himself. He went and reported to Queen Esther. And I believe he urged Esther to get the information to the appropriate uh, officials of the king. So Esther reported it to the king and gave credit to Mordecai for revealing the plot. And of course the plot, you, the, you will see in the Bible that the plot was investigated and proved and then the two people that made the plot were, were um, executed. It's not an assassination, they were. They were, they were executed. Uh, that, that was their punishment. The thing here was the Mordecai got credit for this. The credit didn't buy him anything immediately, but later on it became one of the critical things that contributed to him being elevated above the conditions of penury in which he lived, above the adversity. That's how he triumphed over adversity. So, uh, we'll, we'll look at this more, but let us read the, the details in the Bible from uh, Esther chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. Esther chapter 2, verse 21 to 23. During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bithana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. If it. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were bell on oath. All this was recorded in the book of An Ananas, in the presence of the king. Yeah. So this was recorded, and part of the record was given credit to Mordecai. Okay, so we see two actions of Mordecai that showed uh, one is his uh, kindness <coughs> to his um, daughter, uh, or his uncle's daughter, Another one was his uh, uh, refuse uh, his his recognizing that the king's life was being threatened and reporting it. We'll see some of the meanings of this later on. Then the next thing was uh, 
an, uh, an official of the king that the king liked so much, his name was Haman, was promoted to a very high position. The king promoted into a high position and then published a decree that everybody should kneel and honor Haman. Well, everybody did this, but Mordecai refused. Uh, they found out that Mordecai was not, do, was not kneeling and honoring him the way that they were supposed to do. Um, uh, they, they tried to force him, but he refused, and <coughs> he refused, and that created a problem for him. Uh, we are not going to discuss the problems tonight, but what we, is important here is that uh, even though the Bible doesn't say this, that the Mordecai didn't come at any time to say clearly that, look, I'm not going to do this because I worship God and I don't want to worship a human being. I believe that the reason he, he, he uh, refused to kneel in honor of this man is that he saw this as a, a, this gesture as an act of worship especially since the king decreed it and said look everybody should do this so he saw it as an act of worship and in his heart he felt that he should worship only god so this was an indication that mordecai worshiped god and would give up his life instead of perform an act that he interpreted as an act of worship directed at another being. Let us read about this in Esther chapter 3 verses 1 through 5. Esther chapter 3 verse 1. After these events, King Zerzes honored Haman, son of Amidatha, the Agadite, elevating him and giving him a seat of honor higher than that of all the other nobles. All the royal officials at the king's gates knelt down and paid honor to Haman, for the king had commanded this concerning him. But Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor. If he... Then, uh, then the royal officials at the king's gates asked Mordecai, Why do you disobey the king's command? For day after day they spoke to him, but he refused to comply. Therefore they told Haman about it to see whether Mordecai's behavior will be tolerated. For he had told them he was a Jew. Yeah, he had told them he was a Jew. I can the next one. Five. <coughs> when Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yeah. Yes, so he did, Mordecai did tell them, but telling them he was a Jew, the implication of that is he told them that they have pledged through their ancestors to worship and serve God and that he will not worship another. That kneeling and, you know, the type of action they want, the type of respect they wanted him to give to um, Haman amounted to worshipping Haman or worshipping something that Haman stood for and that he would not do it. Well, let us look at all of this. Uh, there, is, there is more, even though usually our Bible study ends with this slide that says what we learned, but we have about two or three slides on this that is looking at uh, what did we learn about the, the life of Mordecai under adversity. Uh, remember, after all of this, he has, he has done three things that we identified as things that, are, that showed that he worshipped God. He, 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 is, he, be, he came from a nation that, is, that pledged to worship and serve God, and he lived according to that pledge. He did this, but he was still living in captivity. He was, he was not aware that these three things he did actually will lift him 
from his adv above his adversity will help him defeat adversity will will lift him to better much better condition than he had ever had in his life he wasn't aware of that but the the fact that his his uh, daughter his adopted daughter became the queen the fact that he earned credits by helping foil the assassination plot on the king against the king and he refused to worship Raman. These three actions showed that Mordecai lived according to the pledge to worship God. And we, we will go through this in a little bit more details to see how these represent worshiping God. Uh, first, the, the, the first thing we take is his care of Esther. You know, you said that Esther was his um, uncle's uh, cousin and that it, it fell on him since his uncle was there to take care of Esther. But, you know, he didn't have to be that. I think by doing it, he, re he, he recognized that this girl needed, there was a need for somebody to raise this girl. There was a need for somebody to provide for her. There was a need for somebody to guide her in adulthood. So he recognized a need and did what he could to provide for that need. This is a key thing that God created us to do. God created each of us to be his provider assistant. Being his provider assistant means when there is a need, he will position somebody. He will position that, part, that, that need in somebody's path. And the person is supposed to respond by doing what he could to attend to the need. This is what the Christ was, or what Christ described in the, the parable of the sheep and the goat, where he talked about, he said, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was, uh, I needed clothes, you clothed me. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in jail, you came to visit me. In each of these, it's using a basic need. Somebody needed something. Essentially what he was saying is, I placed a need in your path. And you recognized the need and did what you could to provide for it. And because you did this, you are blessed. And the reason you are blessed is that this is what God, one of the things that God created us to do. So when, by, by notice, by recognizing this need, and attending to it, Mordecai was showing himself to be a godly person, somebody that did things in the way he understood based on his understanding of the meaning of the pledge to worship and serve God. And I think, um, to be fair, I jump in yeah. for a sake of time. Yeah. Um, maybe we should actually be, if we can, you know, uh, look at contribution from the uh, you know our guests as well as to what the significance of, of Mordecai's living in adversity you know what they think or what mm. the, the the message you know yeah which is which is um, you know uh, maybe a fundamental part of the Bible teaching today. You know, if we can, you know, get a, a bit uh, of, you know, contribution from them as to what um, that means to, you know, even in, in present day living and all that. Because I'm looking at, because what you're saying here is part of what I see in the adversity that I had to face. This is a man who raised a girl. But then, because of his situation and conditions, he couldn't even associate with that girl as a family member. And this is a girl that you were living or serving or working under her 
you know, her environment, and you obviously have to relate with her. But remember, he told uh, 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 that's Esther not to reveal her identity and mm -hmm. her family uh, background. So that means he also could not tell them that Esther is his cousin. So you can imagine the kind of bondage it is that you are living with a blood relation or working with it and you have to pretend, live with that, you know. For me, it's a serious ad adversity. And this is somebody that you, you know, you, you raised and actually were instrumental to bring into the palace, you know. So because living, the, 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 this, this first one should be able to tell us, oh, uh, you know, what kind of condition that Mordecai was living in that was adverse, which you, you know, you have very well started and explained at the beginning about um, him living in abject poverty and him living, staying, working in the king's uh, whatever. Of course, he didn't make activity. You know, these are some of the things that oftentimes we have to face. Remember, Abraham faced a similar situation when he had to tell whichever king that Sarah was his sister and not his wife in order for them not to kill him. So, I mean, this is just what I'm, I'm thinking. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, before we finish, why don't we yeah. use this opportunity? If you have a comment or a question about what we done so far to the um, essentially what we've looked at is what was Mordecai's adversity what did he do and how does that what, are, what one of the things I'm trying to get out of this is something we can learn from what he did you know, basically in his adversity, even though he had all these deprivations, if I call them that, but he still found it in his heart to do things that he believed, um, things that were consistent with what is what I believe is God's calling for every one of us. Okay, the calling that every person should, if you recognize a need, if a need is placed in your path, attend to that need and do what you can. Um, and then when he was, when they tried to force him to worship a fellow human being, he refused. So these are things showing that he was still conscious, he was still fully committed to worshiping and serving God, even though he was living in adversity. Yes, um, it's a very interesting topic, you know. You just, one of the things that this, this kind of thing teaches is that um, you just, based on the kind of condition that Mordecai saw himself, what he did was to stay fast with God. Mm in discharging his duties, in living under serious conditions like he did. He, he was so loyal to his employee, which is the king, by trying to, you know, I believe he, he was a kind of a watchman or a, a guard, yeah. you know, for the king. And then he looked at, at his uh, job description very seriously and then he, he was able to foil a plot yeah you know that the king actually you know lived and all that he couldn't do this if he didn't actually sit down and keep praising god and you know being devotional and getting god's direction yeah you know his life during that time bear in mind that his stay with god also give him point him to a certain direction that would have been done by holy spirit yeah you know and he succeeded very seriously, and the way Esther has to, you know, rise from where she is, where she was to the being a, a king's wife, is just God's direction. So he just didn't 
acquired the wisdom by just sitting around and not and not worshiping God. God was there with him, and he was actually staying with God all the time. So that's what I, I learned out of it. And I think, you know, we see similar situations in life all the time. It could not just be exactly what uh, Mordecai saw. There are too many situations that we see in life, and this example is one of the perfect examples that will help us go through this situation and still would, you know, prevail. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think what I'm, uh, I'm taking, you know, uh, from this is that I've seen that for everything that we do in life has been pretty destined mm -hmm. by God. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter, you know, what situation or where, wherever you find yourself. Sometimes we, we most times we don't even understand it. <coughs> we don't know why we are placed where we are placed. Mm -hmm. We don't know why, you know, we come across certain things. But God has already you know, done this homework and God knows that this thing is going to happen to us and that we're going to find ourselves in, in this situation. First of all, Mordecai was a captive. He was poor. There was never a time in this world, his wildest dream that he, he thought that he would ever have any encounter with the king. Yeah. And now, Look at an orphan that he was raising. And you know, going through all this verse, it's just like you know, God lifted you know him from dust, you know, to something, elevated him. And that is what you know that what happens in life. There are certain things that you know will be happening to us. We don't really know why those things are happening to us. We might be going through a lot in life. The adversities of life are so much, and it could be in any form. It can come in different ways. But what you know, they say the end justifies the means. What, where, where do we go, or what we, what, what do we get out you know, from all this? Mm. If we stay, you know, stay, stay fast in, you know, God, and we try to understand, you know, read our Bible, and you know, see the face of God in everything we do. You know, sometimes God will show you that this is, you know, what, what is happening, or this is where I'm leading you through. But we just don't, we don't just condemn or you know complain. Well, oh, I'm going through this, I'm going through that, you know, this and that and that. Because there is a purpose for every and each one of us in this life. And it's for us to understand and realize what purpose that we have to serve. So my take out of this is that. You, you, is, you can go through trials and tribulations. You can go through adversities. You can go through a lot of things. But God knows what, you know, why you are going through it. And if you continue to be steadfast, you see that God will elevate you from that thing that you think that is a terrible situation. You know, uh, you know, to elevate you from there to a higher place, or even make things easier, you know, for you in life. You know, that's my, you know, that's my take. So it's my 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 yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. My take and this is that it's good to worship the Lord, and with Mordecai, he's humble, humility. Very important. And he understood that whoever trusts in the Almighty Father 
Do you want to have a friend? Do you understand? Very, very well. Just like Joseph. Mm. He knew that with faith in God, that all these things will come, will pass away. And worshiping God, God did not promise us that everything will be rosy. Yeah. Do you understand that very perfectly? So that's why he's doing all these things. God already condemned him. God already, like what my sister said, he has already condemned that Esther would be the queen. But he took somebody that prayed, that had faith in God, to make all these things to be possible. People of this world will think we don't want, like we are reading it adversity. But maybe to him, he sees this as joy. Because he knows the God that is worshiping, that God will pull him through. Amen. He, this is true. And, but, uh, the, the, so the lesson I think we learn, we should learn from this is that. No matter your situation, that stay focused. stay focused on worshiping and serving God, and worshiping and serving God, you know, means something to us. It means so, it, it has a meaning. One of the meanings, for instance, Mordecai, when he was first with a young girl that needed help, he rose to the occasion and did it from his heart. He wasn't doing it as an obligation. He did it and, and really because he believed that that was the right thing for him to do. When he was faced with a plot against his master, against the king of the land, it was a plot against a fellow human being, but more important, it was a plot against the king. And his since he knew about it, he felt that he had a duty to report it. He had a responsibility. So he did that. When he was challenged with uh, an order to worship another person or to do things that he considered to be an act of worship towards another person, he refused and said, look, I worship God. And in fact, they challenged him and he said, look, I'm a Jew. And we Jews are pledged and we have to live according to the pledge to worship and serve God. So in a key aspect of living in adversity or dealing with an adversity is to remain focused in worshiping God. Remain, re remember that God created us to worship and serve Him. And He promised us that if you worship and serve Him, then He will be your God. And being your God means He will fight your battles. He will take care of this is this the, the, one of the main lessons from the, the interaction between David and Goliath that God will fight your battles if you worship and serve him. Because he said if you worship and serve him, then he will be your God. Yeah, I think that's, um, that's like you said, that's the key thing that we, are, we actually take home from here. Mordecai was in adversity, but he did not forsake God. Yeah. He did not forsake the religion of his fathers where God said, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself any God. You, shall not, you, can, you, can, you can't bow down to them nor worship them. So he still maintained that, even in the face of possible death. Because he could have been killed, and he knew that that was a possibility. It was about the same time that the same thing was happening to Daniel. Yeah. Because they were taken away to captivity. So, you know, these, and as human beings, it's when we face this kind of situations or when we're in adversity that we tend to run away from God. Not just run away from God, we begin to question and oh if God is there, why is this happening to me and all that. That's when the temptation is so great for us to 
turn our backs and begin to question God. But the lesson from this is Mordecai, you know, had issues, he had problems, and he stayed fast. That was not, his problems was not, were not enough. Like I was listing some of those problems, this is a girl who raised, you can't even relate to her. Yes, you are seeing her every time, or you know you're not, you can't even talk about her. You can't. That is, uh, you know, you are there, you know, we don't even know. If his job was important, they would have mentioned it, you know. So he's just there. So that means he's a poor man and all that. And uh, here he is again being expected to bow to another human being. So despite that, he still held on to God and continued to do the good deeds that used, utilized the opportunities that God presented to him. Which part of which, you know, was the conspiracy that we saw. Because some people would have said, which one concerned me? Mm. They want to kill their king, let them go and kill their king. Mm. But he made sure, as a good Samaritan, that the king knew about it, you know? So I believe uh, that's a, uh, you know, something we take home from here, which is good, that in the face of adversity, we should hold on to our faith. Yes. And that brings us to the conclusion of this Bible study. We thank you for participating with us. And we pray that you have learned something from this Bible study that will make a positive impact on your life and bring you closer to God's purpose for your life. Thank you and God bless you.